welcome back to the rake. Uh, we have one of my best friends, one of my oldest poker friends um, today, who is on an absolute tear. Uh, is a long time coming, in my opinion. Um, I'd like to welcome Katie Stone. How's it going, Katie? Hey guys, I don't I don't know if you can hear the rainstorm, but it's like <laughs> literally like it just started pouring. So I hope that you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah, just out here in New Jersey at the Jersey Shore, just you know grinding it out, playing these these online events that they have pretty regularly now, every site is kind of having a bunch of series and stuff. So it's, it's really nice. And uh, I thought they did a different kind of grinding at the Jersey shore. <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe, well, maybe that's- Katie's actually coming straight from Jim Tan laundry. It was Jim Tan laundry podcast. So <laughs> we're happy to have you here. Um, different part of the <laughs> yeah, a little more of an intro just so for people who aren't familiar um, with you. Um, Katie has been a sponsored pro um, with Party NJ, formerly Borgata sponsored pro. I feel like the <laughs> names have been changing a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, and she just recently signed on with Learn WPT to teach a bunch of people how to play poker. Um, what's really cool is that when Black Friday first happened, Katie was actually the one who gave me the nudge to come down to Rosarito, continue playing online poker, not give up. Um, and that made a really big impact on my life. So I'm still maybe thankful, like who knows what, maybe I would have been a like zoologist or like had an animal shelter instead. I'm not really sure. So I don't know whether to say thank you or uh, screw you, but you know, that's some backstory on our friendship. <laughs> I mean, we had a good time though, right? Like I, like I definitely did not want to be the only girl down in Rosarito. Like that was the thing. And mm-hmm. so like, I reached out, like I was like, just begging like you and Jen and Peter, <laughs> or, like, and then. Eventually everybody came down, you know, yeah. but there weren't, you know, there weren't that many women, you know, girls, whatever that were, that were playing full-time online that we knew of at that time, mm-hmm. really, that were able to just kind of like pick up and go. So it was just, you know, it was kind of, it was a little bit easier for us knowing that we were moving into a place with people that we knew, like me and you, sure. like we moved into a, a, a really beautiful beachfront condo with two friends. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was probably, you know, 25 or 30 other people that we already knew within, you know, 30 yeah. yards of us too. So, yeah. yeah that place so, is awesome. Um, I yeah. kind of wanted to ask you about that because you posted about Black Friday. I'll put the tweet up. Um, so many people recently were just talking about how Black Friday had a big positive impact on their lives and, oh, like, here's where we are now because of it and whatever. Uh, I just was reading those tweets in disbelief. I'm like, okay, I understand people are, they get perspective as time passes, but that was one of the worst things that ever happened to me. Like, regardless of how it shaped up afterwards, um, that was just so shocking to have like our freedoms taken away. It was shocking to feel like momentum was going in the right direction. And then it's just like the rugs yanked from under you. Um, you posted about it. Like, how do you feel about this? How did you feel reading all these pros talking about Black Friday like this? Well, I think, like you said, I mean, perspective is everything. I, I do think that people tend to have a little bit of a short memory, though, in in that. Uh, and, you know, I tried to, you know, this is the 10 year anniversary, right? So like Facebook mm-hmm. memories is good for one thing, which, or Facebook is good for one thing, right? So it's Facebook memories. So, you know, 10 year Black Friday memories come up. And so I, I didn't just post and I, I, I generally don't post stuff like this, but I wanted to show people what the after feelings were like the reactions mm-hmm. afterwards. And that was still when we still did things like that and posted our feelings on Facebook, mm-hmm. you know, but like April 16th, 2011, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon when I would usually be, you know, mid session or whatever. And I'm posting like, okay, really like what, like seriously now what? And, you know, that was, that was a very, very uncertain time. And, you know, for me, I was only about a year and a half into my, my online uh, career in poker, I had kind of started live and then migrated online. And you know, I—I I, I mean, I kind of had put, had been putting everything into that, and and I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. I had a house, I had a mortgage payment uh, in Dallas, which I ended up having to sell because I needed the equity in the house in order to survive for the remainder of the year until I moved to an area that I could make a living. Um, so it, it, it was a very uh, stressful time. I mean, I, I remember the day very clearly. I remember 
trying to call everyone and wake everybody up because I just so happened to be in front of my computer at that time. And I was able to make transfers before transfers were frozen. So I was able to transfer all of my funds out to a friend's account, a non-U- non-US you account. You got so lucky. I tried to cash them out because I didn't I know what to so do. I, I rushed home from work from a job I had already quit. I had given my two weeks notice. I'm like, great timing uh, yeah. and came home and I, I tried to transfer some of the money out and it was just like lost mm-hmm. in the internet. And like, I ended up having to wait an additional year after everyone else because I had to dispute my claim. I did get it back, yeah. but there was no guidance on like what the hell we should be doing. So like you were really yeah. smart to transfer to someone in a, an actually free country at the well, time. It was somebody a- sent me 50 K someone who I, I don't think I'd ever even met him in person. Uh, <laughs> I think it was, mm-hmm. can't, it's Nick something pure cash 25 sent me like mm-hmm. his whole full tilt role. And I yes. got a wire down to him. And he was able mm-hmm. to keep playing, but um, That's crazy. yeah, it was, was a, it was a very small window. I remember mm-hmm. because I was actually in Florida for the WPT uh, that was happening. And so I was sharing a house with, we were sharing a house with some friends and I had played like a prelim at the Pompano mm-hmm. Isle casino busted really early, came back and was just like, okay, I'll just play online. Mm-hmm. was literally just sitting in front of my computer when it happened. So, so, so the window from when I sat in front of my computer to when transfers were tri- were frozen was very small. And it was, yeah. you know, me and, you know, my boyfriend at the time, we we're just sitting there. We're both just staring at our accounts and I'm like, okay, what do we do? And, and I remember, and he was just like, okay, let me think. And like a few seconds go by and we're both thinking, and we both just look at each other like, we need to get these funds out of our account right now. And we, and we just immediately transferred them out. And uh, just a few minutes later, everything got shut down. So we, yeah, you know, but crazy. that was, that was important money for me in particular, because that money kind of kept me going for, you know, through a mm-hmm. good part of the year, because I now did not have any immediate income and I had to start getting my house fixed up to sell, which I didn't want to sell my house. I built my house from a business that I started in college. I was very, you know, happy to live in that house for a long time. I didn't anticipate ever leaving that house. Mm -hmm. So, but I had to, you know, can we get a a shout out to the friend that, uh, that was out of the country that got you your money back? I feel like we talk so much in poker about like all the scumbags and all the shady (laughs) shit. And like, this is poker players having a serious life emergency Mm -hmm. and sending huge sums of their net worth and their life role to basically strangers they know from the internet and and being taken care of in that way so do you want to shout out that person um yeah i mean it's just an old friend but yeah it's uh, we're still friends today but uh yeah i mean just uh yeah very grateful for for that i mean that 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 was quite common though i knew a lot of people who you know, did the same thing who were also online and who also were able to just transfer, you know, their money out to people who they didn't even really know that well, you know? Yeah. And I I Um, want to celebrate that, you know, (laughs) yeah, I I have not heard a story of someone doing that and getting robbed. Uh, I'm sure it happened, but I've heard so many stories (laughs) of people who were basically saved by relative strangers from the internet. Um, And I think that's a really cool and under uh, undersold part of our community when when people help out in an mm-hmm. emergency like that. For sure, I think poker mm-hmm. has introduced me to some of the most um, the the highest integrity people I know in my life, and the lowest. Mm-hmm. Like the you know, there's people that I have spoken to like once or twice who I would not hesitate to transfer my whole role to and know mm-hmm. that I'd get it back. And then also there's people that have been like extremely charismatic and amazing and they seem great. And then they're the people who like free roll you. You're like, yeah, (laughs) but that's the poker world. Um, Just speaking of basically having our freedoms taken away during Black Friday. Now the flip side of it, which is that poker is coming to more states. Um, It's regulated. There's a lot of options now. It seems like it's getting better and better. Like this year has been a really big year. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Cause you are a sponsored pro, which is like, it's hard to come by in the U S. Um, and also I would love to hear all about the, the new W, uh, learn WPT sponsorship. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm a team pro for party poker U S network here in the U S which is currently just New Jersey, Michigan. Um, so it's, it's slowly expanding. I don't, I, I don't think that any of us on black Friday, thought that we would only be at this point 10 years I would have lost like 
all my money. I, I thought I was in denial for a year, Katie. Like you had been asking yes. me, yeah, do you want to move? And I'm like, I mean, okay, maybe as a vacation, it'd be fun to go to Rosarito, Mexico. But I was in complete denial that it would even be like two years. You would need to. Yeah, you would, you would need to. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people thought that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I think it's been, it's, it's been a slow progression, but it's been nice. And, um, I have been with party poker us network, which is, there's a few skins. There's bed MGM, Borgata poker and party poker us network. And then as the different States kind of come on board, you know, they'll have those different skins in the different States and that kind of thing. But, um, I came on board a few years ago. I, right after I, um, I took two years off, I had a baby took two years off. Mm-hmm. Uh, from, you know, really everything just kind of stayed home and nursed for two years and didn't really work very much. Uh, and then came back to playing online poker right around the beginning of the summer in 2017 and then signed with them, um, a little, little bit after that. So, um, and it's been really great. I think it's really nice for online poker to be coming back to the U S there's so many, I mean, I know that a lot of people, you know, think that, uh, you know, online poker just is not, is something that's very specific, you know, that you have to be very, uh, you have to be very knowledgeable about something or whatever. But I think that as more States open up, I think that as more people start to play and more people start to win, there's, you know, the excitement is going to be there again. Cause we all remember back in the day, like it was like, it, it was like a Wednesday was like really yeah. exciting because it's like the Wednesday quarter million, the full, yep. like the, 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 the full till, you know, the one on nine rebuy six max that you were always like just crushing in. Like I was always <laughs> watching you crush in that one. Like, it was I was, like, like, like me and Jesse Cohen would just like go yeah. back and forth and be like one and two in that all the time. Like I took yep. that for granted. Cause I was just like, Oh yeah, I play poker, but I'm a lawyer too. And I didn't realize like that, that would be what I look back on is like the most fun time of my career. Exactly. Yeah. And I think like that kind of, you know, that kind of thing will eventually come back, you know, as, as more people and, and live stuff is coming back too, right? Like things are opening up more, more people are getting vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do think that we're kind of in for like a little mini poker boom simply just because of the circumstances that have been put yeah. upon us. And like, look at these live numbers so far, like, like there's like Florida numbers are coming, like, dude, it's insane. Like there's people. <laughs> I was are wondering, just- though, like, is that just Florida numbers? Cause they've been like, what COVID, what are you talking about for the last year? So I'm like, is it just Florida? That's going to be like this huge boom. Or is that in- indicative of like a crazy huge. No, I, th- I think I Vegas think- is going to be insane. Yeah. Agree. Agree. <laughs> I, I yeah. think it's going to be the biggest ever. That would be my guess. I- that's so I don't know if I want to go that like I don't know if I would bet money on that but that's a good statement like that is a solid 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 prediction it's <laughs> it's definitely could happen um but yeah like Vegas like I'm not in Vegas you know I'm not I mean you're more in Vegas than I am Jamie but uh, mm-hmm. I mean it seems like live tournaments are, are kind of going really well there I just seem to see like, like everybody's posting live tournament photos every other mm-hmm. day and so um, and then there's a whole like live poker boom happening in Texas of all places too, yes. <laughs> which is like uh, absurd, you know, with all these, these rooms opening up in Houston that previously had operated in like a, a, a gray area and now they're fine. And so now mm-hmm. it's just kind of crazy and, and they're seeing crazy numbers too. And so I'm headed there after Florida, uh, because they're having a big tournament too. So I just, you know, I think live poker is just kind of going to be really good for the next couple of years, I think, you know? Yeah. Question about that though. Uh, all right. So for people who don't know, Katie has an amazing child named Luca and he's very cute and he's also like huge. He just looks like he's about 16 years old. (laughs) Is he like advanced in everything and sports and stuff? He's He's growing. I mean, he's, he's really, really smart and he's really good at, you know, building things. And he's really, he's, he's got a very advanced vocabulary. He just kind of talked early and just really, um, whenever I would, you know, say new words to him, I would, when he was little, I would always make sure that he would watch my lips, you know, to see what I was saying. And he just kind of picked up on things a little bit, uh, that way. And which is nice because he, he pays you know, very much attention to, to new words. And so he tends to pick things up a little bit faster. So for example, like he, he takes French classes and he's very quick. I mean, all kids are really quick, but he is pretty quick. 
you know, mm-hmm. to, to get the accent in particular. His teachers are always impressed. <laughs> That's cute. His teachers are always impressed that like he gets the accent so well. He's they're like, he sounds so French. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so so making sure your child sees your lips while you're uh while yeah. you're talking to them is like that's a pretty deep mom tip. How deep in the mom lab are you? Are you reading a lot of books? Are you where do you get your uh ideas for how to you know raise a kid optimally? Yeah, I mean, I I went super deep into the mom lab because I didn't work for two years, right? So I remember I played, and that's like one of the things I really I just have to point out. And like, if you want to give a shout out to poker, like give a shout out to poker. Like, oh, like I'm very grateful to poker for that because you know I'm able to take this time off with my child, nurse my child, be pregnant and miserable and not have to work and then still be able to come back to my career, you know, um, and, you know, be okay for, for the most part. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I played my last live tournament during my second trimester. It was the WPT 500 at the Aria. It was July of 15. And that was the last I worked. I, I had Luca in October and then I didn't work again until summer of 17. And that entire time, yeah, dude, I was, I mean, I was absolutely in the lab. I mean, I nursed for two years, which is not easy. It, (laughs) it, it is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I wouldn't change a moment of it. Uh, It's not something I planned to do. I just kind of went with the flow and, and did that. But along that, you know, there was a whole you know, I, I started going to see pediatric nutritionists so I could learn about nutrition because I was nursing so long. And, but they, you know, by the time they, they grow teeth, their, their dietary needs change, but then you start to learn about breast milk and how amazing breast milk does, is and how it actually changes as the baby grows older. So if you took a sample of breast milk in year one and a sample of breast milk in year two, it's a completely different makeup of ingredients. So then like figuring about all what those ingredients are and then figuring out how to complement. So I would have regular visits with, you know, nutritionists to make sure, cause I'm not a, a cook by nature. I'm not talented in the kitchen by design. And so I, this is a, a tough task for me to learn. And so I needed to make sure I was balancing. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those poker really helped actually with that and chess too, you know, just kind well, of wait a raising- second. <laughs> poker helped because you finally listened to all those guys who said you should be in the kitchen. Oh yes. <laughs> they're all, they're very helpful. Yeah. yeah. But how, how hard is that for you to go from like completely independent and you have control of your schedule and more so than people with regular careers, you're making decisions for how you want to spend every minute of the, of the day. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I have to put this down. Um, having a kid and and doing a good job. Mothering is a full-time job. Um, how hard was that for you? And is this, does it have anything to do with like how hard you bounce back into poker and how well you're doing now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I definitely couldn't have done it without my amazing husband. That's like the one really important thing. Uh, Shout out to Joey, who is the most lovable teddy bear of a human. And yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, I love him. And I feel like seeing you from when we lived together in Rosarito um, and like some of the struggles that you were having in your life. And then after meeting Joey, it's like night and day, yeah. like your happiness level and just like your accomplishments have gone like crazy. Yeah. Through this too. It's really important. Like the biggest decision you'll make in your life is who you have a kid with. I mean, it's just, it, it just hands down is the most important decision. And that is, you know, finding somebody who you, who, you know, you just fit with. And that's, that's just kind of us. Like we just fit. And I think any, everybody who knows us and everybody, anybody who spent a good amount of time around us uh, would agree that, you know, we just, it, it just works. And so, um, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely like, you know, I mean, he supported the family, you know, for two, for, you know, two and a half years. I mean, I couldn't have, done that without him. Right. So that's a, that's a really tough thing. And it was really tough. It was tough on just give yourself some credit though. I don't think he could have breastfed without you. Ah, Yeah, no. I mean, he definitely had to help me though. And because (laughs) like when you, when you first come home from the hospital, it's like, you're all learning like where everything, like you don't know what to do. You don't know what goes where. And like, it's all hands on deck and everybody's 
trying to do. And, and there was, you know, there was a period in the first few days where I was not able to express my milk. Only Joey was able to express my <laughs> milk. And so that's like, you know, that's, you do what it takes, you know, the milk needs the milk in the colostrum needs to go in the baby. We're going to do that. I don't care how it's happening. If Joey's the only one that can do it, then Joey can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, there's no way that I would have been able to, to take that time off. And, and then, like you said, you know, come back into my career without a supportive partner for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, you know, that's, that is all in the importance of the partner that you choose, right? Is, is understanding where you are in your career and the time that you're going to take off and then, you know, what you want to do afterwards. We interrupt this podcast with a message from our sponsors at Run It Once. Splashy Hours are back at Run It Once Poker. Each day from now until April 25th, we'll be hosting two separate four-hour Splashy Hours windows during which we'll be increasing the rake back players receive through our popular Splash the Pot feature. During the first two hours, we'll be cranking the rake back dial up to 60%, followed by 45% rake back during the third and fourth hours. This is in addition to any rewards you earn through our Legends program. For full details, head to once.run slash splash. That's once.run slash S P L A S H. And as always, if you're looking to improve your game, head on over to Run It Once Training, where you'll find the largest library of high end poker training content on the web. Created by a huge roster of some of the greatest minds in the game, including Run It Once founder Phil Galfond. Sign up today at once.run slash learn and you'll get free access to three elite videos from Phil and fellow high stakes legends, Jason Kuhn and Ben Sulsky. And now let's get back to the pod. Speaking of jumping back into your career after a long break, uh, you have been crushing it recently. You won a circuit ring. You came second in a giant 1K the same weekend that you came third in another circuit event. Um, talk about how gratifying it is to come back to poker and um, and have it be good back to you. Um, and give me an excuse to get stuck back in because I've been thinking about <laughs> recently uh, my next comeback from retirement. So, so oh. talk about it in really positive, glowing terms, please. Yeah, that that's not tough. So, I mean, that's very easy for me to do. So when I, I came back into poker after I finished nursing for two years and I had taken a few years off, um, it, it wasn't, it was not an amazing comeback. Uh, we kind of timed my comeback at the beginning of the summer because a lot of regs would be going to Vegas and, you know, we were just like, okay, we'll just stay home and clean up. Joey had a great summer. I had like a break even summer and that was a really big wake up call for me. So this was 2017 and that was just a huge wake up call for me. Like I realized that the two and a half years that I'd taken off, I had fallen behind and I probably wasn't where I needed to be anyway. Uh, I, you know, I didn't do very much studying back then. I don't think, I don't think ever, you know, people did as much studying in general. Um, and so, so yeah, I started, I started taking lessons with a few people. I started getting coaching from Gags, uh, Michael Gagliano, um, pretty often, like once every few weeks and we continue to work together. We, we work together like maybe once a month or so. Um, and then I have two, uh, friends who are also online players, they don't play and they used to play in the New, Jer New Jersey player pool. They don't play in the New Jersey player pool anymore. They've kind of moved out of state or out of the country or whatever. Um, and they, they've been really, really supportive and helpful as far as, uh, you know, uh, just my overall, you know, uh, process of, of kind of coming back and kind of re having to relearn a lot of things and, purely learning things that I just didn't know before. Um, and then, you know, I've got a lot of other really good friends who are, who are really good at poker that, it, that's, uh, have been very helpful and supportive along the way. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty much. Yeah. That was, uh, that Rosarito kind of opened my eyes to that. Cause you and I have talked about this a lot, how, you know, there are opportunities for women in poker that men just don't really have but then there's like little things along the way where it's like much harder to break in like 
if you're getting invited to live in a grind house, you're like, wait a second, like, am I being hit on? This, this is when I was in my 20s. I was like, I don't know what to think about this. Now I'd be like, I'm not getting hit on. They just like want to hang out with my dog. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but in those days, it was hard to figure out exactly like what angle people were coming from. So a lot of women kind of like isolated themselves. They would get hotel rooms on their own. They would end up paying more money for stuff like that. Um, and they wouldn't really like have these opportunities to really connect with other people. I feel like Rosarito was that for me is like hanging out with you. Oh, speaking of dogs, Leia's coming in right now. Hi, puppy. Hi. <laughs> um, I feel like I feel like that puppy is a direct result of Rosarito too, right? Like, am I, <laughs> am I wrong or right? It, I mean, all right. So Morty Silas Watson's dog uh, changed me from a cat lady to a dog person. Um, and seriously, that dog was so oh, cool. Oh, hang on. You but, were a cat lady? I yes. was a cat lady, but I'm still a cat lady. Like I will, I will take any cat too. I'm more of a dog person, but like, I don't, I'm not going to hate on cats on this pod, no matter what you want to say, Ben. My, I, 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 I don't know if I can deal with this. Jimmy. Like my whole, my whole image and understanding of you is, is just yeah, crumbling sorry. apart right yeah. now. Came to Mexico, and I have both come a long way. I, I need yeah. to like, take a step away for a few <laughs> weeks process. Yeah. Well, now my train of thought is completely derailed. But what I was saying something about how like it's harder for women in poker to find that like trustworthy group of people that they mm-hmm. learn from and that they like teach stuff to and whatever. Um, and like Rosarito helped me find those people like Ben Yu and Clayton Newman and and like just and Sai. Like there's just people that came out that I was like, OK, these are people that are going to like help me in my career. I feel like you're finding those people now, like you're working with Lucky Chewy um, and and Nick Binger and other Learn WPT people. Um, and I feel like that's like an amazing opportunity. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and what you're going to be doing? Yeah. In the future? yeah. So something really cool that happened. Uh, so Party Poker US Network ended up partnering with Learn WPT, which is really cool. Uh, it's going to offer, you know, the players a bunch of different um, just you know, different learning tools and stuff like that. Um, but I do commentary. So I've been doing, I started doing commentary in 2018, uh, for, so Borgata used to have the big WPTs like September and January. And so I would do the, uh, like the stream commentary for those. And then we would have like some other big events too. Um, and then with the, online uh day twos they're streaming them now so i started doing some of the commentary that in that's kind of uh in partnership with learn wpt and so that's kind of uh evolved into uh chewy and i are going to be making a really fun series uh reviewing the recent 1k that we had online in new jersey that got huge it was just it was huge it was like a month-long promotion they promoted the event for an entire month so it got to be like a ginormous prize pool. And so, and then I ended up getting second in that. And so there were a lot of really interesting hands. He and Tony Dunst were commentating the final table. And so we're going to go through the hand history where I think we're going to start before the, the money bubble a little bit before, right around talk about some of that, and then kind of go through some of the, the key points, uh, you know, different stages getting down to, the final table and then eventually, you know, getting heads up. And I think it'll be really cool because there were definitely a lot of very interesting hands. And just from the short discussions that Chewie and I have had on discord, uh, you know, he just, I, I just realized how much I, you know, have to, I mean, I, I obviously know how much I don't know because I feel dumb every single day, but I really, really, really have a lot to learn just based on very few short conversations we've had so far. So, um, so that'll be really cool and that'll be exciting to, uh, to, to get out there. And I think it'll be nice too, for, um, you know, just, just to have another female face that's out there, uh, doing instructional, you know, doing something instructional, something other than the, you know, I mean, you know, what we generally see, uh, in poker and, and, you know, there, there just aren't that many women that are, producing instructional content out there. And I think, you know, just reflecting upon my own beginnings in poker, when I first started playing poker, I just instinctively tried to find a female coach. And when I, I tried, I approached two different females to coach me because I came from chess. And so that was like what you did and you had a chess coach. So I switched to poker. I'm like, okay, now I need a poker coach. And um, so I was kind of, that was like 
that's like a very, very, very like vibrant memory from my very early poker career days is that I desperately wanted to learn from a female. And that wasn't something I thought about. It was just, just a feeling that I had. And the fact that there weren't any females out there teaching. And really there just still just aren't that many females out there teaching. So, um, you know, I just think it's, I, I just think it's a good thing to do. And I, I, I would think I will enjoy it. And I think that it'll help me become a better player as well. Teaching is a great way to, uh, to, to hone your skills and it'll help with commentary. And I've, I've got some pretty great, great teachers and Chewy and Dunst, like I'm learning from the best, you know? So, uh, I, I can't ask for more. So I'm really grateful for to, to be able to work with those guys for sure. You've talked a lot about your experience as uh, a woman in poker. You've also done work uh, both out in front and behind the scenes to make the experience better for other women in poker. Uh, can you talk about some of the stuff you've done with the poker TDA, the tournament directors Alliance and, uh, and maybe some of the other stuff behind the scenes that people don't see as much that you've you've tried things that you've tried to do to make the game more welcoming. Yeah, sure. Um, in so in 2019, I got the opportunity to teach, or I'm sorry, to speak at the uh, TDA Summit, which is held every two years at the Aria, traditionally uh, hosted by WPT Matt Savage. Uh, and then there's a panel of tournament directors. It's a really cool event. It's about 200 tournament directors from all over the world. Everybody comes in for this. Uh, it, it's sometimes for a lot of people, that's the only time they get to see each other because they're not, they're coming from the opposite side of the world. You know, they're just not getting over here very often. Um, and so I got to speak about just some of the efforts that we had been uh, just kind of instituting at Borgata in particular. So um, I'm a team pro for Party Poker US Network, but I also kind of, you know, before COVID, I, you know, worked a lot in conjunction with Lambase as well. So the Lambase team and, um, you know, there was a real, a real concern and a real effort that wanted to be made in making the, the poker room more inviting for all players, not just, uh, you know, female players. We just wanted the environment to be a hospitable environment. And, 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 you know, I know that the East coast sometimes gets a bad rap and, you know, maybe Borgata gets a bad rap. I don't know. Maybe Atlantic city. I don't know. I've never heard about anything like that in my life, but you know, we just wanted to do our part. And so I, you know, I had a few ideas and they probably got sick of hearing them and they finally were just were probably like, okay, take the mic and say what you're going to say. But um, you know, it was just, we, we really just had to kind of communicate with everybody. And so I just started communicating with a lot of our long time regs and just saying, Hey, like if you knew that it, it would be okay for you guys to stand up and say something, if you saw, you know, something happening at the poker table, regardless of if it's a man or a woman, you know, being disrespected, if you knew that if you spoke up and you knew that the floor and the dealer would have your back, would you be more likely to speak up? And overwhelmingly, the answer was yes. And so I think that that's why a lot of people at the table, you know, you always, I think everybody has seen some kind of harassment or some kind of abuse at the table, you know, in some kind of form. How many times do you see someone actually do something about it and step in and say something like insert themselves into the situation? It doesn't happen that often. It's probably not in your best interest to step in to that situation. Right. So, um, so by kind of getting everyone on the same page and, you know, allowing our longtime regs to know that if they do see a situation where a man or a woman is being mistreated or disrespected or a dealer is being mistreated or disrespected, which unfortunately happens a lot in live poker, you know, if you say something, we will have your back. The staff is going to have your back. The floor is going to have your back and everybody knows what's going on. And so it was just a grassroots effort. And it was, you know, Tab, our, our tournament director, he would give me the microphone before the big opening event that forgot. Everybody knows how big those things are. It's like a thousand people. And this is before all the players would come in. So all the dealers are just seated in the, in the big convention room. And he would give me the mic and I would just, you know, let the dealers know like, hey, look, like this is the effort that we're all, you know, trying to put together here. Everyone is in this together. So if the players, if you guys see the players, you know, starting to say something, you know, just understand and be ready to kind of back them up and be ready to call the floor and be ready to, you know, 
do something to help, you know, stop whatever kind of behavior is happening. Um, and I think it worked, you know, because we had, we had a few people that, you know, before COVID, uh, hit, you know, we had a big live series in January and we had a few new people that came in and they, you know, they all communicated that they had really great experiences and everybody was very friendly. And, and of course that's just one time, but I, I, I like to think that, um, you know, those kinds of things go a long way. And so, you know, I had a few other ideas that I presented at the TDA summit, which were, geared towards helping poker rooms be more uh, conducive to, you know, happy environments, such as a code of conduct, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, instituting some kind of, you know, behavioral code of conduct, you know, kind of zero tolerance policy for uh, any kind of behavior, you know, just get them out of the poker room. Um, And then the other idea that I I proposed to them was, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Playground in Montreal, but they have those really cool seat lights, you know, like every dealer Mm -hmm. seat has those tricolor lights behind them. It's like a pole that stands behind their chair. And it's for like one light is for waitress, one light is for uh, our server, one light is for tournament and one light is for, I forget what our food. Um, and I just, I just, I says, look, these are a great way. Like if every, if every room had these, they could also serve as a great diffuser, you know, like if the, uh, I also suggested that dealers be allowed to issue warnings at the table, but if the dealers aren't comfortable issuing warnings at the table, or if a, a floor does not want to, you know, give that responsibility to their dealers, which I understand, you know, you can have these lights, these light poles. And if a dealer or a player feels like something is, you know, getting a little out of hand, you can just very, very, you know, quietly and, and non-dramatically press the button on the light and and somebody will be alerted to just kind of wander over. And one of those lights can have a particular meaning, you know, like a a particular meaning as far as like, you know, potential situation, please come over to potentially diffuse. And, you know, nobody's, nobody's calling the floor. Nobody's making a big deal about it. Nobody's being singled out. The attention is not being diverted. It's just a very secret way to be like, Uh, just you know be aware of what's going on over here and yeah I I think one other thing you could do that they wouldn't have to install anything um a lot of places in Vegas are catering a lot more to the players than than you know because they have competition so they want they want to make sure that you're having a good time so they end up texting you when your seat's ready there's two or three places that will do that um and I'm like if we have the lines of communication open like that then it would be nice if there was just a number that goes directly to like the floor person so no one has to know anything's been said no one has to know who is the person who's reporting it but you could just say like hey some guy is like touching this dealer a lot she looks yeah like whatever and the floor can kind of come over and see what's going on without having to have a confrontation and they can decide on their own um i feel like that would have helped there's there's only been a few like a handful of situations like that um since i started playing poker but there have been a couple uncomfortable ones where i'm like oh if there was some way to anonymously say something without causing a big scene i definitely would have so maybe that's something for um poker rooms to keep in mind that that wouldn't even cost any money it would just literally cost a little bit of the floor person's attention and i liked what katie said about maybe giving the dealers a little more power i think that um warnings are okay but you know it becomes difficult to keep track of uh, the the warnings if the floor is not giving them, you know, like what is a dealer warning? The dealer still has to communicate that to the floor. The floor has to track the player and the seat and everything. Um, so I, I think that's kind of challenging. I think maybe um, a, a more efficient thing would just be to install giant cartoon springs under the seats and then the dealer has an eject button they can press when someone's being abusive. Um, and And that I think will keep everyone in line. But I think I think the idea, the the three lights idea is okay too. I, I think everyone kind of just I've seen so many situations where people are get getting close to the line or getting over the line and just having the floor come and stand there behind them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like yep. it's like the teacher is looking at you now and everyone just starts, yes. everyone just is on their best behavior and everyone kind of calms down a little bit and de-escalates and and um, you know, uh yeah starts starts coming back to the right side of the line because no one wants to get in trouble with the boss or the teacher or whatever. Um, it's it's kind of a funny dynamic, but yeah, having the capacity to just press a button and call the floor over, uh, I think would be great. Um, and yeah, and it could like, be, I- you could even have buttons under, you know, like everybody's seat instead of just the dealer. And then 
it's not clear who pressed it. Nobody knows who called for the floor, but the floor is coming. Yeah. Up yeah. And like, I remember uh, a situation from a World Series. I think it was 2019 World Series where, yeah, it was because it was the same summer that I, I gave that talk at the TDA Summit. And I was just, and it was a situation where I was like, I, I wish we, like some of these situation, you know, ideas would have already been implemented because there was a guy at my table who got very upset with the, you know, the run out or whatever, lost big pot and was like on his heat, like very angrily through the cards directly at the dealer, like really hard, really sharp, really like, and he was in the three seat. So it was like, he was, you know, just like zoom right there. And it's like, okay, like. I understand like big pot, like going to give him some time, not going to say anything, whatever. But like, then he did it again, like very soon after that. And then he did it again. And so like, nobody said anything, you know? And I'm like, finally, I'm like, okay, I have to say something, you know, but here's the thing. Like, yes, I did speak up and yes, I said something, but that takes so much energy from me. Right. Like it takes my focus off of poker, which is not great. And it's changes everything at the table because now everybody stops, you know, I'm like confronting this guy, which nothing good is going to come from this situation, right? Like zero good will be accomplished. Like he's not going to change his, his, you know, mode, right? He's not going to change what he's doing. All that this is doing is like negatively affecting me basically. Right. Like I'm looking out for the dealer because the dealer does not need to be abused by this guy. So think about like how much better that situation would be if there was just someone, like you said, like some anonymous way to just notify, I don't have to expend the energy. The table dynamic doesn't have to change. I then don't have to explain, you know, cause then the, then the floor comes over and I have to explain what, what's happening and blah, 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 whatever. Like, you know, it's, we can just avoid that entire situation. And I think that's the kind of, behavior that really affects change, right? So like, you're not, you're not trying to change that one guy who's behaving poorly, but when that one guy does see the reaction from the rest of the table and the room and, or the room or the floor, that's how the behavior of everyone else starts to change. Right. So, you know, that's m- more so what I'm interested in is just kind of changing the culture. And, and that's really what I wanted to do with Borgata. You know, I really wanted people, I mean, I realized what a big, you know, I, I really wanted people to come to the Borgata poker room and, and just be like, this is a really happy place. This is a really, you know, nice place to play poker. And that, that was a challenge that was, you know, that was a really big challenge, but I think it can be done ever, anywhere. I think those are some great tips. Um, I want to end with um, just talking a little bit about going forward. So now you're on a tear. How is this going to change your future plans? Because you've been playing poker for a long time. So everyone knows that like, you know, you could win 150K and then just like lose it by playing 10Ks and 25Ks and all the stuff that people like all the mistakes people make when they're like 21 and have money. Um, yeah. I'm guessing you're past that point by now. I was 22, uh, ha- Jamie. Thanks. But <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, Ben. I was talking directly about Ben. Um, but what are your plans? Is it going to change anything? Is this just, oh, add this to the bankroll pile? Or is there some big shot taking in your future that you're going to do now that you have all this like newfound money? Um, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm still kind of, you know, making rebuilding from last year um, because there was, you know, no live poker last year. And even though I'm primarily an online poker, live poker, did make up a very substantial Mm -hmm. chunk of my income. Uh, I mean, I live down the street from Borgata. So, you know, any kind of, you know, $400, $600, 1K event, like I was there, right? It's just so easy for me to get there. I come home on dinner breaks. It's just very, very easy for me to, you know, and when you're playing that much, you're, you know, you're going to cash a lot. So that was, that was a little bit of a, of a tough thing for us last year. And then, we were actually, uh, we were actually outside of New Jersey for a good portion of last year too, for some family issues. And so we spent a good chunk, um, the majority of last year, just not working. So, um, we are definitely in kind of, you know, grind back catch up mode, so to speak. And, uh, I'm, I'm pretty conservative. I mean, Jamie, you know, you know, we're, you know, kind of how I look at these things. I'm, I'm pretty conservative. I, uh, you know, I 
sell action. You know, I like to try to keep my average buy-in, uh, you know, kind of low and I mean, low for what I'm playing. It's, it's somewhere, somewhere between two and 300. And then, you know, for the, for the bigger things, I, I, I sell action. So I'm, I'm not a huge shot taker. I just have never been. Uh, I mean, you know, I put my dog in a car and moved to Mexico, like basically by myself initially, you know, like I, I knew people were there. So, so that's kind of like a shot, right? Like that's a big shot. But in general, I'm not that huge shot taker that I'm going to, you know, uh, put a huge, you know, a larger portion of my bankroll in play. I think, I, I don't know what that, you know, maybe just being a mom, just being, I don't know if that's whatever, but oh, I, I okay. maybe that'll solve it, Ben. I think Ben, if you become a mom, you might be able to deal with this issue you've had your whole life of just shot taking too much. <laughs> that's- uh, but then I'm going to have to really confront my issue of hating other people. If there's another person there all the time that I can't mm-hmm. get rid of. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's six of one half dozen of the other. Right? They're really cool. The really cool thing though, kids are really cool though, because they're, I mean, they're a lot of work in the beginning and stuff, you know, like I'm out they're, when they're babies and you know, <laughs> they, they, they really rely on you quite a, quite a bit, but my son is, he's five and a half now. And so, you know, he's learning chess, he's learning French, he plays Mario, he builds, he plays Legos and Transformers, and he has his favorite colors, and he likes his favorite activities, and he likes to pick out his clothes. And like, all of that stuff is just really, really, really fun. And seeing the little brain, it's like a little science project, you know, it's, it's seeing the mistakes that we've made as as people, humans, and then kind of thinking about it and really making a conscious effort of, you know, how can we, uh, you know, possibly steer them in a path where they're going to make a, a different decision or, or make a you know better decision or something like that. So, yeah, that's, that's a really, really cool part of it. I have to say. Um, One last thing though, about that then, and then I'll, we'll wrap up, but what if, uh, what if Luca wants to play poker? Uh, how are you and Joey going to handle that? Cause I feel like at some point, He's yeah. going to want to play watching you on live streams, watching you teach um, and just knowing that, you know, it looks like a video game to a kid. Um, what if he wants to learn in a few years? I would totally not be surprised if he wants to. Uh, I mean, he's he's been around games his entire life, just like me. He's been, you know, he's been in he's been around chess his whole life. He's been around, you know, poker his whole life. He's been around video games, his, his you know, uh, Mario and whatever Transformers and stuff. And so. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's totally fine. I think it's, I think it's, it's moderation is important. And I think that because, because we come from a chess background, it's a little bit easier to kind of pick out the really good parts of, of the games and what will help their little brains mm-hmm. develop and what is good. And then what is also not so good. Um, but yeah, that's totally fine. I mean, I, I think that, I think, I, I know that, you know, when I had Luca, I was a poker player. And I remember one of the, the most like vibrant thoughts in my mind was, okay, like I have a son now, I owe it to him, not only just myself, but I owe it to him to be the best poker player that I can possibly be. And so that was really, you know, I, I I think I owe him a lot of, of the inspiration that I've had also in, in, um, just kind of really just finally, you know, getting up and getting after it, you know, because I, I want to do, I want to do well for him. I want to be a good example for him. I want to see his mom, you know, out there crushing. How cool is that? You know, like having a mom crushing, like that's, you know, that's pretty cool for a little boy to see, I think. So, um, so yeah, that's a, a huge inspiration for me as well. Yeah, well, I think uh, I would say that you're on the right track as you have probably one of the best weekends of anyone in online poker um, this year. Uh, (laughs) So, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the pod. It's been so awesome catching up with you. um, And I really hope to see you continue crushing uh, and would love if you can continue the crushing all the way through the WSOP in the fall and just take home a bracelet. (laughs) I hope so. I'm planning on it. Thank you so much. I hope uh, I hope you guys, too. Yeah. And thanks so much for having me on. I love your pod. And uh, I'm so glad and honored to to be on here with you guys and uh, hope to see you guys at the final table soon. Sounds good. Thanks very much, Katie.